All right. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us here. We love you. We praise you. And we, we pray that you will give us wisdom as we consider what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, 1 Samuel 7. We're still in this time where the Philistines are dominating the Israelites. We talked about how the Ark of the Covenant was taken away and all the adventures, if you want to call them that, that the Philistines had with the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, and then they said, well, we better send it back where it, where it belonged. And, 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 and it went back. Now, it says here in verse 1, Then the men of kiriath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in kiriath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So for 20 years, what are the people doing? They're lamenting after the Lord. For 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant is in, is in kirith Jerem. Where had it been kept previously? Anybody remember? Bonus points. Where had the Ark stayed beforehand? Wasn't it at Shiloh? Yeah, Tabernacle of Shiloh. Yeah, it was in the tabernacle of Shiloh. So, so it wasn't really home yet, but it wasn't with the Philistines yet. There it is. And what are the people doing? Lamenting after the Lord. So they're weeping, they're wailing, they're crying. Lord, 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 Lord. Help us, help us, help us. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, if... You return to the Lord with all your hearts. Now just think about that statement. Does that, read, does that read that way in the rest of your Bibles? If you return to the Lord your God with all your hearts. What is that clause revealing? If you return to the Lord your God with all your hearts. Is it saying you have returned? No. <clears throat> if, if you return, then... Put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So all the while the Israelites were lamenting after the Lord and crying out to the Lord for deliverance and asking the Lord for deliverance and weeping and mourning and wailing. James says to do that, weep and mourn and wail in James chapter 4. That's a good thing, but what was missing? They were still repentance. Repentance. Idols. <laughs> still worshiping idols. Hedging their bets. You know, keeping these other foreign gods with them as well as crying out to the Almighty. All the while, for 20 years. Now, does that say anything to us? Is it possible that a person could spend his entire lifetime weeping and mourning and praying and asking God to, 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 to deliver him and help him, all the while there's some big old elephant of a sin right in front of his face that he needs to uh, get rid of. By the way, big old elephant of a sin is a theological term. No, it's not. <laughs> It's just what I said. You know, we've got these things. It's, it's like the man who, who let, me, let me fix that. Let me pull that uh, uh, moat out of your eye, you know, and he's got to know what Jesus said. You've got a plank in your own eye, walking around trying to help people, and you've got, and you're not helping yourself. They had a major, is, where does idolatry fit on God's uh, um, scale of good and evil? It's in the top 10 of the no-no list. <laughs> okay. Very good. Yeah. One of the Ten Commandments. Don't, don't worship other gods. Okay. It's one that they should have known not to do, and yet they were, and yet they were still doing. Now, if uh, the reason I'm kind of belaboring this point, you, you can read it. You see that it happened. We can do the same thing. We can be crying out to God. We can be weeping to God. God, help me, help me, help me, help me. All the while, there's this big thing that we just haven't dealt with. 
And what is God saying here? What's he saying to them? If they will get rid of those idols. Yeah, it disappeared for a second there. I, I, I saw you, your head go in the swivel. Um, if they'll get rid of it, what pro blessing is promised? He'll pray for them. Not only will he pray for them, he'll, God will deliver them, right? If you'll get rid of the idols, we, I will take the yoke of the Phil Philistines out from under you. 20 years. So again, what does that tell me? I better deal with the sin because that there, there, there's something there that I need to deal with that may be cutting me off from wonderful, wonderful blessings and wonderful, wonderful protection. Why would a person hold on to a sin for 20 years rather than dealing with it? Yes. The thought that came to my mind is when a person genuinely <clears throat> loves the person they're living with, however, they are living in sin, mm -hmm. an illicit affair. Okay. So they got to take care of that sin. Got to deal with it. But it's very difficult because... And that is how God sees idolatry. They love yeah. the person they're living with. Mm -hmm. You've got that emotion. You want to have that relationship, but you've got your stash of uh, ice cream here. My mom used to say, you can't have your cake and eat it too. There we go. And Wes, you were going to say something. Yeah, your, your question about why someone would do that, they're comfortable with it. Okay. Right? It, it's what they know. It's been working for them. And they see potential benefits in it, okay. right? When when it comes when it comes to idolatry, you know, the idea behind it is that you pray to a god and something goes your way. Mm -hmm. um, Why not? When when that seems to happen, mm -hmm. not to, to say, you know, what actually caused it. Probably just coincidence, but yeah, you know, you, you see that happen, you're like, oh well, that that worked for me, so I guess I'll just keep doing this. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, the Philistines keep coming every other week and taking your stuff and yeah. doing, doing harm to you. Um, what? I don't want to speculate long on this, but I do think we need to for a few minutes. Uh, I don't have any idols in my house in terms of, you know, graven <laughs> images and statues of you know, um, any Canaanite, I don't have any of that stuff. You know, my, my brother brought home from a trip to Eastern Europe uh, when he was in college, he brought home a gargoyle, which is supposed to ward off evil spirits. I didn't, I didn't like hanging that on my wall. I got rid of that, you know. I just don't like spooky stuff, okay? Does that mean that I'm exempt from being an idolater in this age? You got a TV set? There we go. Yeah. We got those. We got those idols. You know, we 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 fire them up every day and and uh, bow down to ESPN or or whatever. Um, what other looking at that way? And why would we say a TV could be an idol? I, I'll tell you. For me, viscerally, that is something that can take time away that I could be devoting to God. Just as simply as that. There could be devotion to entertainment such that you don't, that, such that you don't have a, 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 the kind of relationship you could have with God. Something that gets in the way of your relationship with God. So if we define idolatry as something that gets in the way of our relationship to God, what form could idolatry take if it's defined that way? Relationships. Relationships. You, 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 you might be in a unhealthy, ungodly, adulterous relationship that needs to be ended. You might be more willing to follow what your parents are telling you than what God is telling you. What mama, dad, what mama say, what daddy say, the things you grew up in your, in your family, that can, that, can, that can draw us closer to God, or if they're, if they're ungodly, that could take things, some of you in this, in this room have come to God and that's, you had to choose between God and your families. 
Yes, Moise. Ambition to <clears throat> kind of get more money, like you, your ambition, ambition to uh, work all day, all time, just to make a lot of money and probably become greed for money. Greedy ambition, worldly ambition. Yeah. Uh, okay. Excellent. Yes. Um, one thing I've noticed for our, you know uh, world is people worship themselves to like they see themselves as like a higher power, like they have this uh, yeah you know this power, like God has power, and it's I see that a lot. Like uh, they look at themselves and they see themselves as very like, powerful. Even some Eastern-ish religious <laughs> viewpoints would, would even say that. We are all gods in some way. So the worship of self, worship of making yourself according to what your desires are. I, the, what we're dealing with in our culture now where people are deciding they can make themselves a man or make themselves a woman going against the divine order. You know, if you're born a woman, you're a woman. If you're born a man, you're a man. That, and, and the very idea that you can, to me, this is, that's kind of a form of idolatry. The self is elevated above what God, above, above what God says. And uh, that's an extreme example that's becoming less extreme every day. Um, God help us. Anybody else? Yes, Wendy. I, was say, I saw this and then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything that takes like the majority of our thoughts away from God. What are you obsessed with? Yeah, so sometimes it's your health. Like, you know, people who are bodybuilding or, you know, they're trying to do the next pill or miracle pill or whatever it is. Sometimes they don't like what they look like or they don't like, you know, whatever it is. And so, mm -hmm. um, that could become an obsession. Mm -hmm. um, anything that that absorbs your thoughts to the point where you're questioning God's promises. Right. Like God promises that you're loved, but you might not feel loved because you don't look like so and so or you don't, you know, act like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Anything anything that challenges God's already set laws and promises. Yeah. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, Chris. It's just the order of priority. If anything is going to take a priority over God, that's stealing from God. Yeah. And that becomes the idol because now that is more important than God. I, I am the Lord thy God, he says. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If he says no other gods before me, then should we have no other sandwiches before him? <laughs> You know, whatever it is, if it's getting in the way, you said it, Chris, if it gets in the way of God, yes. Uh, in the Air Force, I worked a lot with engineers and scientists, and I have heard some say that science is their God. Right. That they do not believe in the supernatural, they do not believe in God or son. They believe in science. That's right. What a horrible mistake because science is constantly changing. It's constantly changing but in God science. It never changes. And, and, and honestly, science in the form of technological advancement has done an awful lot of harm. Go back to, go back to Dr. Mengele's office in, uh, in World War II and the experiments he did on people. Consider the implications of artificial intelligence with which the people that are pushing that are attributing godlike powers to this new form of technology. It's not going to end well. Because God is a far more intelligent being. He invented intelligence. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna and we're gonna well, we're making something, but it's not gonna be pretty. Yes. Andy and Andy invented science. Andy walks with me and he talks with me. <laughs> oh, cool. what, is that what you say? The song? He invented science. Oh, and he science. invented science. I thought you said Andy invented science, and I thought you were telling that old joke. No. Uh, okay, all right. He did invent science. Yes, yes, yes. I just remember when Hannah was eating maybe six or seven, 
and we were doing her homeschool work, and she said, Mom, you know what, I love science? And I said, why? She said, because science is all about God. Mm -hmm. She, as a child, could see mm -hmm. how God was, was taking care of everything and putting everything into place, and we grow up, and we think we're so much smarter, and move <laughs> science above God, you know, because we're so smart. Yeah. And, and we should not forget in this age in which we feel like we have outgrown God I'm not talking about us I'm talking about secular America the foundation for the industrial revolution was laid by godly scientists the foundation for all of the things that we have in, in our day you know the the, the the discovery of the way physics works by Isaac Newton, a Christian. The discovery of all the biological things by other Christians. It, it's all of this stuff. You go back four or five hundred years, and a lot of our modern day prosperity would not have been possible had it not been laid, that foundation not been laid by Christians who sought to believe in God and to find God in nature. And then Darwin and some others tried to disprove God in nature, and I don't think that's blessed us. Now, so there's a lot of things that can become idols, okay? So if you don't do anything else with what we're doing today, I want to ask you when you go home to look yourself in the mirror and ask God to reveal the idols to you. And... Put them aside. You don't need them. It's slowing you down. They lost 20 years. How many people died during that 20 years of lamenting after the Lord? How many of them died under the, still under the yoke of the Philistines? Hundreds, thousands, more than a few. 20 years their deliverance was delayed because they cried out to God and worshiped idols at the same time. Yeah. In addition to that, the ark was a central part of things like the Day of Atonement. And if that was in Kirjath Jerim and the tabernacle was still in Shiloh, then there's no way they could do the Day of Atonement and receive forgiveness from God for 20 years. And you can't imagine what that's like not being forgiven for 20 years. Okay. You see that? Okay. Then, let's see. Put away the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you. Prepare, prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the bales and the asterisks and served the Lord only. They did it. He told them to do it. They did it. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. Okay, so they put away their idols. Samuel calls them to the prayer meeting at Mizpah. So they gathered at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and, they, and said there, we have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now let's think about this. The the idol was taken away by the Philistines when they heard that the Ark of the Covenant had come into the camp and the people were shouting. Right? Big revival going on. There's the Ark. God is with us. And that didn't end well, did it? Compare, and con compare this meeting to that meeting. What's different about it? I'll read it again. Gather all Israel together, if it was five, to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. It doesn't mention shouting, does it? There might have been some. I'm not saying, you know, but it doesn't mention that. What is mentioned? What is emphasized about this meeting? What they said. Huh? What they said. And what did they say? We have sinned against the Lord. Mm -hmm. We have sinned. 
We have sinned. We have sinned. And what else happened? They fasted. They fasted. They prayed, they fasted, they repented. There's no mention that there was a big revival meeting. Now, I'm an excitable person, and I'm kind of loud, so, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't mind being in a really happy, worshipful experience. What was needed for Israel to be delivered? Was it, was it a bunch of hype? Was it a big, loud meeting? It probably was a big meeting, because all Israel was there. But it was a big meeting of penitence. They've been weeping and wailing for, they've been lamenting for 20 years. What they needed to do was be repenting. I, I may get in trouble for saying this, but I think that's what our country needs. We need prayer and fasting and penitence. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord again. Um, anything else you see in this meeting? Yes, please. Uh, so personally, I would say that uh, sometimes uh, it's not just uh, if we discover that we are doing something or we have we have a sin, we've sinned against God. Uh, it's not only enough for us to confess our sin to us to God in our personal prayer. But I think it would be good if we call on an elder or a servant of God, like you for instance and then like sit down and confess that sin and then you have that prayer with before the law in the presence of yeah. the servant it's a good the way. bible tells us that doesn't it okay confess your sins one to the other pray for one another that you may be healed it says in james chapter chapter five and and yes i think it's right to to confess to someone else there's some confession that needs to be done in front of the entire congregation, and then there's other confession that needs to happen maybe in a more personal way. If, if I've wronged somebody, I, at the bare minimum, oh, that person, okay, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'll do whatever I can to make it right. You know, don't hide from it. Don't run from it. Somebody recently told me, who's going through this process right now, about how much lighter he feels. How heavy are you right now? You can lighten that load. And that's, what, that's what's happening here. They're lightening that load. And, and I want to, why is it that we are so unwilling to do the thing that really would set us free and that would be to go to that person and say, I admit it, I'm a stinker. I did you wrong. Why are we so unwilling to do that sometimes? Is it fear? Is it shame? Is it pride? Well, they did something to me too, you know, so I'll do it if they will. Okay, you said you said pride? Yeah. Well, fear and shame kind of are neighbors of pride, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, we, if we get over ourselves, mm -hmm. we get over ourselves. Um, it get better. Now when the Philistines heard the children of Israel gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. So they heard about this, uh, this penitence that was taking place. <coughs> and when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Well, yeah, the Philistines have been dominating them for most, some of them their whole life. So the, so the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So, so you've got this great penitence that's coming forward. They're feeling lighter. And then the devil comes right after them right away, doesn't he? Yeah. And that's what's happening. Now, what's different about Israel in this situation? Have they quit? They've quit hedging their bets. The idols are all gone. They're not diversifying their devotion. They're worshiping the God of Israel and, and him only. And they say to Samuel, keep on praying for us, brother. Keep on praying for us. Keep on praying for us. Do you see how Israel is different now? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a game plan for us to have victory. I hope you can see that. This is how we can prevail in life. This is how we can prevail in our mission. Admit it that you have sinned. Cry out to God. Get rid of your idols. If you need to tell somebody, tell him. And get the body of Christ praying. 
Does that make sense to you? And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, do you notice, is there any battle strategy, strategy given to us here? Is there any way that they're going to... There's nothing said about the battle plan. As, now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Stone of help is what Ebenezer means. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come anymore into the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel recovered its territory from the land of the Philistines. Also there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Twenty years they're lamenting after the Lord, crying to the Lord, whining to the Lord, please, 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 all the while they're edging their bets. When they finally gave up their idols, finally admitted to God they sinned. What happened sounds easy, doesn't it? God scattered them, and they chased them. So, church, do we have some repentance to do? That's what this is all about. If you want victory, if you want victory, if we want victory, we've got to deal with the sin in our hearts. We've got to get rid of our eyes. And we've got to worship God and worship Him only. Any other thoughts on this? Anything that might have been overlooked in the in the telling of the story? Or the, yes? Um, I don't think we can, uh, it's not just the, you know, getting rid of all the sin. I think it's the importance of prayer, too. Samuel prayed. Mm -hmm. Samuel was a prayer. And um, I think sometimes we forget the importance of prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we let things pile up because of that. Instead of dealing with it with prayer. Well, I, I'm thinking about something you told me that I'm not going to ask you to retell, but I know one very important point in your life when through prayer you discovered your sin and, and that was where the deliverance came from. Probably happened to some of you too. Have you ever been praying and the thought hits you, well, wait a minute. I'm not so, uh, I'm not so good. <laughs> And so the prayer of begging turned into a prayer of penitence. Yes, Wes. So I've been kind of dealing with something back here. So if this has been mentioned, <laughs> I, I really apologize. But one of the one of the things that I always thought was always think is interesting about this story is that Ebenezer is the place the ark was taken from. You're right. That's right. Just a few right. chapters before. Just a few chapters before they were encamped at this place. Was it called Ebenezer at that point? It was mm -hmm. called something different because it's not called Ebenezer now. But it's the same place that they fought against the Philistines and lost because they were misusing God. And then he <laughs> sets up now, stone there. Now Samuel has come into the picture and said, this is how we're going to do things. God comes, saves the day, and, Eben and, and Samuel raises the stone. The place is now called Ebenezer. So this, this, this place where they lost the ark is now... The turning point of things. of the nation, yeah, the refounding of the nation <laughs> in some way, in many ways, yeah. Yes, please. So in verse eight, uh, what's happening here could also happen to us that sometimes after Satan's and then we sound our life to God and we are praying about the situation. Things may probably look worse. 
as it was before. It looked worse for them in the moment, didn't it? Yeah, and it will be easy for us to say, okay, now I'm doing the right thing and things are even worse. So it will be easy for us to give a burden. If you look at what they did, that's, I think that's, that should be the moment you should be more, uh, you should run towards God more because that means that the victory is, is close to you. Well, the victory was right within their grasp, right? And if they turned away from God, it would have. Been. But since they continued, they, they continued turning to God, cry out for us, Samuel, don't cease praying for us. They kept, and, and, there, and there comes the victory. Yes? Um, I, I've read this verse multiple times, but I'm having a hard time understanding why they did this. It's um, six. Where I'll start at five. It says, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together and drew water and poured it out before the Lord as fast as on that day, and said, There we have sin against the Lord. What's with the drew water and poured it out before the Lord as fast as that day? Like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean? The only other time in my memory from reading the Bible, where I see water being poured out as a sacrifice, was when David's mighty men went and got some water for him from a well that was very, <coughs> the well that they drank from one child. He was kind of wishing he could drink his water again. And they fought a battle, just fought a battle to get to that well, just to get him a drink of water. And when they gave it to him, he poured it out before the Lord. He said, I can't, I can't drink this, this is your blood. Uh, is there any other place in scripture where the, the pouring out of water is mentioned in kind of a ceremonial sense? I, I can't think of anywhere. Yeah, Matthew? It was often used as a cleansing. So when you had admitted your sin, yeah. when you were unclean, you had to wash to become clean. So it very well could be symbolic of the covenant and the cleansing that they needed for these things to work. Makes sense to me. I mean, you're right about the the, the, the washings and baptisms even that they that they did. Um, that's that's I can do with that. Yeah, yeah I, I wish I do more, but I don't. Um, I do I do want to leave y'all with one New Testament idea that I believe this story illustrates. If you would quickly go to the book of James, chapter um, four. I think in many ways, what they went through illustrates the principle that James is talking about here. What did you say? James chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask and miss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now to me that illustrates pre mizpah Israel. That's where they were. They weren't. Their, God wasn't hearing their prayers. They, it was all just falling apart on them and it was their selfishness that took them there. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives us more grace. Therefore, he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Was God resisting Israel? 20 years. And that was preceded by many more years anyway. 20 years God had not budged. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. I believe in many respects the three chapters that we've looked at over these last few weeks have illustrated that principle that James is talking about here. Confession, repentance, prayer, fasting, weeping, mourning, putting aside all of your idols 
Stop being an adulterer. Stop being an adulteress. And again, if we've got other gods, whatever they are, other, other things that we pursue more than God, you're an adulterer. If you're an adulteress. Father in heaven, forgive us. Cleanse our hearts. Remove from us the sin that so easily besets us. Help us to recognize it. Help us to renounce it. Help us to weep and mourn and wail and pray and fast. Because, Lord, we cannot lift ourselves up, but you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, chapter 8 next week. Uh, I guess we stopped. But the end of chapter 7 will start next week.